Bronze and Modern Gods. I'm John, and that's not Richard. No, I am not. Hi, Evan. I am Evan. Hi. Uh, for <laughs> people who are uh, kind of shocked right now, uh, Evan is here because Richard is off in the wilds of Tennessee, I believe. To Tennessee. 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 That's all I can hear. Every time I hear the name Tennessee, that's all I can hear. We took him to another place. Uh, is, I believe it or not, in four years, this is the first episode that either Richard or I have missed. Wow. Uh, we've taken weeks off a couple of times, but we've never missed an episode where we've had to have a guest host. And of course, we thought if we have to have a guest host, why not uh, our backup who is always ready? He's always swinging uh, in the batter circle itching to strike Richard on the back of the head with the bat and take over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, somebody has to bring the modern to bronze and modern gods. So here uh, I am. I, I think you also have to bring the uh, looking at your books, the DC to this uh, program that we uh, frankly don't do enough of. Uh, so we're glad to have you here, Evan. Everybody say hi to Evan. We've got all our usual stuff. Evan's been brought up to speed on how to handle the underrated book of the week. We've got the old fart rule where we go back to 1984. We've got viewer mail, believe it or not. And we always start off with our hot book of the week. Evan, what is it? Our hot book of the week this week is, of course, because Richard's not here, <laughs> Doom number one. <laughs> All the weeks for Richard to miss the show. This is like, this is like, you know, I don't know. Uh, you you have to go out of town and your favorite band is reuniting for one night only in your hometown and you're not there. Yep, that's uh, right. This is Doom number one. It's a one shot that's, you know, it's no surprise. It's been a couple of weeks. It's taken off in the secondary market. Why do you think this is, Evan? Why do you think this book is so expensive already? Yeah, well, so it's not cheap to begin with, right? right. Like the cover price on it is a little, a little heftier. There's uh, a bunch of pretty cool variants. And Fantastic Four's got a buzz for once. So like, you know, the movie's coming out. So now people are really into it. And uh, the bad guy in the book is Galactus, which I don't think is a coincidence. Spoiler. Yeah, sorry. I, it, it's clear. I mean, they're clearly trying to get people excited about the movie and they should. So, um, but I think it's it's big money because there's a buzz about the Fantastic Four and the variants I think are or something. I, I even, I got a variant. Uh, so, the MF Doom uh, it is. variant. Is that, I believe that's one in 25. One in 25, that's right. Yeah. And of course you guys saw a couple weeks ago, I was able to get Richard the one in 100 for my uh, awesome LCS Pulp Fiction here in Long Beach. Thank you, Ryan, for hooking Richard up on that. Oh, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt my, my LCS. Uh, Comic Heaven, thank you, Jim. There you go. Uh, Beautiful. Let's talk about LCS's six ninety nine price tag on this book. Not four ninety nine, not three ninety nine. It's no. giant sized six ninety nine, one shot. The last Doom series sold what it sold. I think this book must have been massively under ordered by retailers, and I don't blame them. That, that's a big risk, paying fifty percent uh, for a six ninety nine book and taking multiple copies in your store and hoping it sells. Yeah, and and especially. I know Doom is a big deal, but uh, a villain as a giant yeah. size book at seven bucks, right? That's that's quite the risk, and and the supporting character is is uh, Valeria Richards. Yeah, like it, it it's it's a quite a gamble, but I, you know the content is solid. I love this. Read it. It was really good. Oh yeah, it was great. Um, kind of a, a had a little bit of a Secret Wars mm -hmm. flashback because. Doom gets to be a little cosmic, which was pretty sweet. Uh, I love the relationship between him and, and Valeria. And uh, yeah, and having Galactus as the big bad is is worth the price of admission for me. So um, it's kind of a little bit like a what if too, because it takes place way in the future. So I don't know how much of it is going to be canon. Okay. But um, I, I thought it was a pretty solid read for, for a price tag like that. Selling for 50 bucks in high grade raw on eBay right now, just for cover A. What do we think about this on a spec level? I That always worries me when something blows up like this so fast and FOMO kicks in. If Fantastic Four comes out and it's terrible, it will not help. 
<laughs> well, even if Fantastic Four comes out and it's great, is this the book? You know, um, I wish we still had access to pre-order numbers uh, that yeah. were to from Diamond and Capital City, because then you could really yeah. say, oh, you know, there were only twenty-five thousand of this ordered or whatever. I'm making that number up, by the way. I do not know the orders, but put yeah. yourself in the retailer's shoes for a minute. You know, you've got a limited budget. You know, you have to pay for these books. Four people put this on their pool list out of your, you know, your pool list uh, stock, and you have to yep. decide whether you want extra copies for the shelf at six ninety nine a pop. I cannot believe this book was heavily ordered. Yeah, there was copies on the shelf when I got in there, and this this was the only one in twenty five he had on the shelf. So you know, me being me, I picked it up, but uh, I'm glad I did. You didn't have a chance to pick up all the cover A's and shovel them in your bag. <laughs> I did not. I, I, seeing as I buy. Uh, 12 to 18 books a week. It's, I'm not picking up multiple $7 copies of Doom number one. Those so. days may be over. Uh, it, it, I tell you this, if you love Doom like Richard and Evan, you love the Fantastic Four, keep it. If you're like me and you have no love for this and you are able to snag one at cover price, flip it now, turn it into something good that you mm -hmm. really want to collect. Um, you know, And use those proceeds to support the show. Yes, you can become a member here right on YouTube uh, for the cost of $2.99 a month. That is $4 less than Doom number one cover price. You get exclusive live member only streams on Thursdays. You get an extra show and tell episode on Wednesdays. Shout outs in future videos. Look at the names, Evan. Look, your name's on there. Mine is in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and this always helps Richard and I and Evan go to more shows and provide more coverage in 2024. We will be at San Diego uh, this year. We will be at Neo Comic Con uh, in August right after that. Want to join? Want to help? Hit join. It's right here next to the subscribe button below on YouTube. If you're on the podcast, just head over to YouTube and then you can subscribe and join there. Let's take a moment, Evan, and okay. remember someone we lost this week, another Bronze Age greats. Yeah. Don Perlin passed away this week, which is a, a bummer for us that grew up in the 70s. Yes, for sure. I it is is it a sign that we're getting older that a bunch of our our faves are starting to fade away because uh, it huge it's bummer. Mu musically, comic books, mm -hmm. everything, right? Pop culture, they're not. I think I had a a screed on this a few weeks ago on the show where I said, if you have the chance, now is the time to meet your idols because they're not going to be here forever. They never are. Uh, I, I'm so glad I got to meet Jack Kirby. Um, I did meet Don Perlin very quickly in passing at the height of the Valiant craze yep. in the 90s which was cool uh we know don perlin from a long run on books like werewolf by night he co-created moon knight yep uh doug mensch and of course i know him mostly from valiant when valiant first started don was one of the stalwarts that really helped and also um <clears throat> team america <laughs> <laughs> i was this close to pulling out team america today for show and tell i'm just going to warn you now i have the whole run I do too. I love that book. <laughs> I read it now and I'm like, okay, whatever. But as a kid, <laughs> I loved that book. Yep, that's right. But to your point, like uh, I got the chance to interview Neil Adams before mm -hmm. he passed. Super nice guy. Um, you know, plug, your, plug your channel. So, well, um, so this is back when I was doing a, a comic book podcast that I no longer do called uh, Dark Knaves uh, Week and Geek. But he was the nicest guy ever. Him and the guy who played the green ranger whose name is skipping right away from me, but he passed away also. Right. So, um, but one of these days there's going to be a podcast like this where people are going to be like Todd McFarlane. Oh my God. Oh, you know what I mean? I so mean, I, I mean, we're not wishing death on anyone, trust no. me, but it, it, we're all knocking on 60 and you know, again, lifespans are much up higher than they were when we were, <laughs> I mean, you look at people like when we were kids that were in their 50s, they look like they oh. were 80, right? Yeah, my grandmothers. Oof. They, <laughs> well, the, the comparison that I always hear, and I, uh, it's the best comparison I've heard, the girls who play the girls in Sex and the City are significantly older than the women who played the Golden Girls. I know. And oh, man. Oh. You, and poor Sophia, her face looked like a catcher's mitt. <laughs> so, you right. know. We're, we're aging better, but they're not going to be around. Look, the point is go to shows, get in line, 
tell the people that you love that you love them because they're not going to be here forever. And let's move on to cheerier things. Evan, why don't you take us to show and tell? Do the move. Okay. I, I don't know the move. Just do it. I'm just oh, this. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, I will start. Okay. I, I don't have a theme, really. I just have some books that I was uh, going through and uh, just stuff that struck me as I was doing that. Uh, Rawhide Kid 39, The Ape Strikes. I know you're a huge Rawhide Kid fan. I know it. Why am I? When I see covers like this, um, this, well, I have the camp factor, obviously. Kitchy. Yeah, it's kitschy. And you know what? They still wheel him out from time to time in they DC. Do. Now, yep. look at this cover. It's Jack Kirby, my favorite artist of all time. Obviously not one of Jack's better covers because the ape, Rawhide Kid, and the guy leaning out the window apparently are 30 feet tall. <laughs> I was just going to say the guy in the window is hilarious. I don't know oh, how God out that window like that obviously this was you know jack was in the office and you know, dropping off pages and stan pulled him <laughs> over and said i need a cover for rawhide kid jack and he just sketched this out um inside dick ayers the the story is bonkers um it, it starts off with a splash page of the ape attacking rawhide kid and it just goes downhill from there uh there's a mad scientist who wants to put the rawhide kid's brain into the body of an ape why who knows it's comics uh and this goes on for pages and pages and pages and it's 1963 marvel they're kind of hitting their stride the focus is on the superhero books and you got the b-level talent handling the westerns now i i love i love a word blurb is this the kids final defeat oh i miss stuff like that every once in a while somebody does it for fun but like it's always the last fight let's remind everyone the Rawhide Kid carries two pistols with bullets. This should be <laughs> a 10-second confrontation as far right. as I'm concerned. Yep. Now, there's my first and awesome first show and tell. What is your first book for show and tell? All right. So I'm going to rep the members only for a minute. Like those of you who uh, have go to the members only episodes may remember an episode where I was livid. Oh, yeah. I got Got some books back from CGC. The biggest offender was my ultimate Black Panther number one. The corner, top right corner, was wrinkled badly, like somebody walked it into a wall or something. And I pressed that book to perfection when I sent it in. I was so mad. And uh, so I went back and forth. Do I send it to CGC? Do I? What do I do with this book? Like, I really want to take care of it. So I cracked open the CGC case and I will say this, the new CGC cases are really hard to break open. <laughs> I had to pull a screwdriver and a hammer out and tap away at the top until the thing finally snapped. But um, so kudos to them for that. Cause like every video you see, they're like slide in the screwdriver and pop it right open. That oh, you I, just can't. Do the, I just do the twist. You can't do that anymore. <gasps> it's, oh, it's, yeah, it's rough. Okay. So I pull it out. I pressed it. I think I pressed it three times and then I sat a whole stack of heavy cardstock on it for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was going back and forth on whether, whether to send it in. And when it came back to me, it was an 8.5. I did not take a picture of it because I was so mad. Right. I'd love to show you guys what this book looked like, but I was so mad. I lost track of taking a picture anyway. Then CGC announces we're going to buy JSA and we're going to do signature verification. I do have some mighty Thor signature verif verifications, 337.89, Walt Simonson. They look great, but I'm like, ah, should I just wait and send in? I have Alex Ross's Batman issue that from Comic-Con and I missed the, the verified signature books, but he signed it and I have this signature of, verif of authenticity. I'll send that in with it. So I did. I, I sent it in. And uh, one thing I will caution people on is that CGC has uh, an extra charge for the signature verification and an extra charge if you want to have the signature graded. What? 25 bucks to get the signature graded. And then if you're on the back of a CGC, it'll be its own grade, the, okay. the signature. They're grading the signature? Yes. 
Yes. Because okay. I wondered why, why is it an extra 50 bucks to do the signature? Are you sure so I went verification cost. The verification cost is $25. The grade of the signature is $25. I'm just warning everyone now. Can you opt out? Yes. So I did. I unchecked that because I don't care. Right. And um, I sent the books in along with my first appearance of Lobo, Omega Men, and um, oh, uh, Marvel team up Spider-Man and Invincible, which I saw was jumping up in the uh, in the prices. Nice. So I pressed that too. By the way, I want to thank you and Rich for teaching me how to press books because Yay. they turned out so good. I was super excited. Good. So I send them in and I'm thinking, if they're given nine nines out, mm -hmm. these books deserve nine nines. Mm -hmm. They did not get nine nines. I don't have them. They're in transit right now. Otherwise, here, I would show them to you. Here are your books. Mm -hmm. uh, I see your Ultimate Black Panther. Mm -hmm. Form Foreman variant 9.8 white your your Alex Ross Joker cover from Batman 134 four five 135 five uh, authenticated 9.8 white Marvel team up 14 with invincible 9.8 white dude you know how much that book is in nine yes I do I'm very right. excited thank and you your, uh Omega Ren 3 6.5 okay so yeah. <laughs> what happened to you so that that was back when I was not taking care of my books. Okay. So it was sitting in a box, not boarded, not bagged. Can I ask years. why you bothered to have it graded? So some of the books that I'm grading, one of them I'm going to show next in show and tell, is to lock them in mm -hmm. so that they stay that quality from now on. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to get that one. Is it a person like you've had it forever? And okay. All right. And well, I, and I love Lobo and he's about to, there's all the rumors about Momoa might play Lobo and oh my God, he might be in the movies and whatever. So kind of perfect. It, it's fine. Yeah. So, all right. So that's your first show and tell you're counting that as a show and tell. All right. Yes. Let, me, let me give you an extra bonus one behind you. Cause I know people probably have not seen this. Your crow number oh, one, 9.0. Yeah. Is that a first print? It's, it's second print, oh. but I'm every day. And so I got it cheap on eBay. Every day I look at that thing and I think to myself, I'm going to crack that open and I'm going to press it because they didn't. You can <laughs> okay. see there's waves in the, a lot well, of the, the last, pages. last year at Comic-Con Revolution, uh, James O'Barr was there uh, and they were doing witness signatures. So I would wait until, you know, Mr. O'Barr comes somewhere and then get That's it signed. Then press it and then send it in. Get yeah. it. I know because you're a, it needs it. And so. I know you're a huge, huge fan of that title. So I, I think that would be worth it for you. Yep. My next show and tell, I waited for Richard not to be here to show this. <laughs> not really. But it's another thing. I why is he not here this week? <laughs> up a 110 with Iron Mask. Now, oh, who does man. Iron Mask look like to you? Does he? <sighs> Is that Dr. Doom in the old West? Here? <laughs> so is that an actual iron mask? Is that the, the point it of the story? Is. Yes. <laughs> uh, and he wears like armor. That's the whole thing. Um, and I was going to say he looks like Pharaoh lad from yeah. superheroes, which is another reason why Richard would love this. So this is uh this is 62. This is about contemporaneous with Dr. Doom and fantastic four uh, early Marvel Jack Kirby doing the cover looks great you know spend a little more time on this one Raw they're the camera. right size everyone's the right size the city's there uh and uh but the insides you know jack keller who was uh the regular artist on kid no. cold but uh, really uh pre-hero you could call it prototype i don't know if it's prototype because if it's the same time as dr doom just interesting that they would do this um mm -hmm. One of those books in those Marvel Westerns that commands a bit of a premium. And this one's beautiful. I would say it's this 8.0 or so. Nice. Um, yeah, it I, looks great. You know, in the old days, I'd have all these slabbed. And now I'm like, no. <laughs> F you. Uh, what is your next show and tell? All right. My next show and tell is what I was just talking about, where I had a book. I've had it forever. And I wanted to lock it in its current form and not let it get any better or, wor or worse, actually. I, I did press it. Um, so it was actually in worse shape than it is, but this is my Nick Fury agent of Aww. shield. Number one, a 5.0. That's cute. So <laughs> it, again, I did the same thing with my, uh, X-Men 46 that I showed off 
uh, during one of the members only broadcasts, but, uh, nice. I, uh, it's sentimental, right? Totally. I mean, yeah. and, and the funny thing is this is one of those books where I was at a comic show, just buying whatever I could get my hands on. And this was one of them. I have a uh, Dr. Strange number one, and you and I looked at it together and somebody did some altering on it. So I'm not sending that one in. I think I bought this one at the same show, but again, I, I pull this one out every once in a while and I had it in this weird plastic container and I'm like, I'm just going to get it graded just yeah. to, just to make it stay in this condition. So that was a shame about that. Dr. Strange 169. I saw it when I was in Cleveland visiting yep. you. I, it had obvious color touch, uh, which is yeah. it, it, don't bother, but that um, I don't mind a good Nick Fury slab. Uh, no. Steranko, you can display it. it looks nice. It's got um, the Zodiac or is that Scorpio on there? Love yeah. it. CGC boards. If you guys are not going to the CGC forums, especially, I shouldn't tell you these. I shouldn't tell you my secrets. Especially the gold, uh, golden age and bronze age for sale forums. Mm. Good deals. This was up there. I got there too late. And I'll tell you why. But I got this. To replace my Astonishing number 6, which I just showed the other week that it came back restored, this is Astonishing number 6, 4.5. It is off-white to white pages. It's higher grade than the one I got back that was restored. Yep. And I paid $600 shipped for it. That's not bad. Amazing. That's he had a, a Marvel Boy... Or I sorry, an astonishing number five, which is the only other one that I or sorry, a four, which is the only other one that I'm missing for this full run. And somebody got it before I did, and they got a screaming deal on it. I was wow. so, so angry. But I was able to get this one and I'm super happy. Um and That's I'm gonna nice. sell, sell my other one in the next live sale. Uh this is the issue in the back. You've got some staining. That's constructively, yeah. it's great. Uh, you just got the staining and I'm not going to crack it and try to remove this. I'm not going to do that with a golden age book that I'm happy with. Um, After what I did to my blip number one, do not <gasps> tell, try. Everybody. <laughs> tell everybody. What did you do? Uh, I had some staining on it and I uh, did a whole ton of research and everybody's like, try this, try that. So I got deionized water and a spray bottle thing and the whole thing. It's, just as bad as it was. And so um, I'm going to press it out and just leave it raw. And if somebody wants it down the road, that's fine. But there's no sense in getting it graded. You got to practice on those junk books first. I got, know. It was my go, own damn fault. Go in the dollar bins, find something that's got like really egregious stains and ruin those. Don't start, I know. Don't start on a blip number I was one. so confident. Oh, my God. The, at the videos I watched, I'm like, this is easy. Dumb. Yeah, sure. Dumb, uh, dumb. What is your last piece of show tell? Bring us out of the doldrums. All right. So this one's interesting. Uh, I'm not going to show it yet. Okay. I'm going to tell you what it is, and then I'll show it to you. Get my coffee for this. So I was looking at kitschy, silly books that I have, and I was originally going to show off uh, What If number 34, which is the silly right. uh, issue. Great issue. Yep. And then I'm like, uh, you know what? I'm going to show this off. This is really strange. So I did some digging and I have Battlestar Galactica from Marvel Comics number one. So I looked this up on uh, GP analysis and a number one goes for about 60 bucks. What? A 9.8 slab. A 9.8. Right. Gotcha. And then I'm, I see out of the corner of my eye, $350. And I'm like, what is that? Newsstand? No, no. The Whit Whitman variant, yep. which... This is my first time learning about the Whitman variants. Oh, okay. So all three are Whitman's, one, two, and three. They came pre-bagged. They yeah. did, and I must have opened them up. And um, But they, they have the diamond, and they have the blank where the UPC code goes. And I can't believe, like, I had no idea. So I learned a ton today just going down a rabbit hole of what Whitman variants mean and how I must have gotten this because I don't remember buying this at all. I mean, you I was a probably, kid. You were probably at, uh, in our neighborhood, neck of the woods. We didn't have Toys R Us. 7-Eleven. 
the 7 That's where I bought my books. Yep. Or maybe you were at KB at Great Northern Mall and they had the flag. <laughs> or Westgate, yeah. Westgate. Um, so, you know, we broke that, uh, that broke that story in our Jim Shooter interview a year ago or two years ago that the Whitmans are not reprints. They were printed at the same time as the other books and they were um, black plate changes. Now, having said that, I do think maybe the Battlestar Galacticas are actual reprints because why would they I guess. do why would they do each issue and hold them to, for I three months to pre bag them? Maybe they did, who knows? But so so the funny thing is that the this is has two listed on GP analysis for mm-hmm. 350. These two don't have any listing. Two and three yeah. are not on GP analysis at all. They probably haven't. Nobody's bothered to slab them and sell them in the recent. Yeah. So, so I don't. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I'm going to press them, yep. and then uh, I don't know. What do you think they look like? Uh, so the the two and the three are rock solid. My one, when I opened it today because I rebagged it, there is a little tiny fold in the top back corner, mm. uh, and it. I don't know. It's probably been that way for years. So even if I press it out, I don't know if it's going to go completely away, but. I'll give it a shot. You should try to remove the stains too. Hey, let's move on to viewer mail. You've got mail. All right. I thought you lo- I thought you loved me, John. I I do. I kid I threw myself you. in front of you and you kicked me. I kid because I love. First piece of your <laughs> mail comes to our email at bronze of modern gods at gmail.com from Brian Thorne. Listener to the pod since day one. Oh, I apologize for that, Brian. Uh, those early episodes are rough. I appreciate your knowledge share, measured takes on collecting, and that you managed to keep the latest episodes filled with Black Hawk. <laughs> How do you weather the collecting doldrums? Lately, I find that nothing I see at cons or shops excites me. I don't find myself wanting any particular book or having a collecting goal. Sometimes I find myself looking at my stack of boxes and thinking about reclaiming the space. My thinking is ultimately this will pass and I'm probably being affected by the down feeling around the economy and collectibles market. I should say that I've always collected within my means. Thanks, Susie Orman. (laughs) But I can't help feeling lately like I'd rather park my money in the bank. I know that John has mentioned the great sell-off in the past. Any regrets? Any advice on making it through a down period and finding the collecting joy again? Thanks again. Nothing better on my Monday morning dog walk than a fresh bronze of modern gods. Brian, who you can find awesome. on Instagram at all underscore my underscore comics. Brian, it happens. Um, I've been through it. Evan's been through it. Richard's been through it. We it's each taken a nearly a decade break in between collecting. Uh, like you said, I had the great purge. I sold everything. Mm-hmm. Even my Captain America's, I sold everything everything i couldn't take it anymore and then i came back this too shall pass i think also you rightly so are looking ahead to retirement and what is my family going to do with these if you have family i'm sick of looking at these things do what you got to do my friend Uh, and by that i mean there's a certain short box that you absolutely love that you would never get rid of Great. Set that aside and get rid of everything else. Reclaim that space. Uh, Find, does this bring you joy? As they would say on Netflix. Um, (laughs) So that's my take on it. Um, I do know that sometimes when I'm over Marvel and I, you know, there's no joy there, I'll, oh, Atlas War. I'll start picking these up or Marvel Westerns. Evan, what's your take? Yeah. So I kind of treat my comic collection as, I do my 401k, to be Mm -hmm. honest. I buy what I like and I just don't look at it. Like I, you know, uh, if I keep looking at my collection every single day, I think I would go a little crazy. But there's been, to your point, times where I have abandoned books. The 90s are a perfect example. I missed out on SM300 and a whole bunch of stuff. I think the only book I collected through the 90s was the X-Men's main title. Mm-hmm. And that was just because I was interested in it. But even that was like Adam X and like oh, pouches and spikes. And oh, my God, it was so bad. But I eventually came back to it when I had the means to to handle it. I think, though, with my collection, and it's interesting you bring up retirement because you and I have had this conversation. Rich and I talk about it, too. When I retire, I think I will spend my days buying 
pressing, grading, selling books for yeah. fun and just having a good time with it. And then, you know, this stuff, which is my pride and uh, collection, but I have a ton of stuff over there too. I could sell off runs. I could buy stuff I never got to have before. That Hulk 181 um, is the direct result of going to Comic-Con and having the money to buy it. Yep. So, uh, you know, if it brings you joy, do it. And if not, just leave your collection alone and, and let the market kind of handle itself. It, it's, it goes up, it goes down the nineties. I mean, the whole industry almost crashed and burned. So it's fine. I'm not worried about it. I half joke. I, I would say it's not even half a joke. I would say it's probably an eighth of a joke that, you know, in retirement, I'm going to move to Palm Springs and rent out a VFW hall once a month and just have a comic show for the heck of it. Yeah. For the joy of it. And uh, it's not going to be a money making venture. It's going to be something to do in between uh, roasting and frying eggs on the hood of my car. Uh, what is your first piece of viewer mail, Evan? Uh, my first piece of viewer mail comes from Mike Will on YouTube. Hey, speaking of Blackhawk. 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 In the late 1960s, DC tried to revive slagging sales of three titles by updating them. Mm. Blackhawk was given superpowers. God, I forgot about that. Yep. Wonder Woman had her superpowers removed, like mm. they do. And the Metal Men were turned into humanoids. Mm. To say the changes didn't go over well would be an understatement. Fans howled, women groups protested the depowering of Wonder Woman, and the two of the titles were soon canceled. DC actually blew away all traces of the update in Black Hawk 242. Comments on these changes require more than I didn't like it. What did you think of these major changes? And what about the unheralded Mike Sikowski, one of the few DC writer artists who worked on two of the titles? Talk to me. So... If I had, if I had a nickel every time <laughs> comic book companies decide to make a major change to their characters that are stupid and terrible, I would be rich. I can't be, I have ranted on this podcast about DC and Marvel ruining their, tri their trinities. Mm -hmm. So Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, Iron Man, Thor, Captain America right as movies are coming out or TV shows or something big, right? But it happens all the time. You get a writer in there. He's like, I'm going to change the status quo and make things really cool. And that's terrible. And very rarely does it work. Archangel, Venom. I'm already Superman. running out of ideas. Burn Superman? Uh, I was not a fan. Man of Steel, you mean? Yeah, Burn Fantastic Four. Back to Basics. She Hulk in the Fantastic Four. That was good. But it's like digging for gold, mining for gold. You get a nugget every once in a blue moon, but most of it is just crap. And so it happens. Mike, I'm going to talk specifically about the three examples you give. First, let's go backwards. Let's start with Mike Sikowski. Awful, awful, awful on Justice League for years. A big barrel chested, weird anatomy, <laughs> grotesque. Not a fan. However, right. however. Diana Rigg, depowered Wonder Woman. Huge fan. Prince. Love it. Love Diana Prince. Prince. Diana Rigg is a <laughs> no, the, very different character. The, the inspired oh, by. Oh, yeah, yeah. She was by the Avengers. Yeah. The, the Diana Rigg Avengers. Yes. Yep. Uh, loved the Diana Prince era Wonder Woman. Loved it. Now, there were some clunkers in there. The lesbian uh, fear story <laughs> being one of them. Oh, dykes are coming to get us. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some 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 funky stuff there. I Ching did not age very well. No. Uh, things like that. However, very bold uh, to do that for uh, Wonder Woman and the Metal Men. The Metal Men didn't really come off, but in both cases, the books were going to be canceled. You had to reach for the stars and try something. So uh, surprisingly, I like the Mike Sikowski stuff, the later stuff. Um, the Blackhawk reboots. <laughs> the less said about that, the better. I know you want me to talk to you about it, Mike, but oh, I, I remember that. Uh, what I do love, like you mentioned, those last two issues where they completely said, okay, mea culpa, we screwed up. I believe it was Mark Wolfman wrote those last two issues and drawn by Pat Gabrielle. Um, beautiful. Back to World War II, back to yeah. mercenaries, what they were supposed to be about 
really solid final two issues, but it was just too late. Um, and again, the less said about the 1976 issue revival, the better. Uh, I love Steve Skates. I did not love his Blackhawk. Uh, but yeah, um, surprising that I have fondness for some Mike Sikowski stuff because he is not a favorite of mine. Moving on to my next piece of your mouth from our good buddy and member David Siegert. John, in reference to your four for $10 acquisitions at Comic-Con Revolution, are any of these for your PC? If so, then what has to leave your collection as per your rule? David is referring to my one in, one out rule that I have now, which, you know, going back to uh, Brian Thorne's email, maybe that's a good rule to have. If you get something, something's got to go. Mm -hmm. I am keeping the Warlords. I have a soft spot for Mike Grell in the Warlord. It was well done, well written, well drawn in the pencil stage title till Vindy Coletta, Coletta pooped all over it. Also, as a young, closeted adolescent, Warlord has a special place in my heart with his loincloth. I will just say that. I will admit it. It's my Jungle Comics. It's my Sheena. Uh, it's my uh, Betty Page. So I'm going to keep those. What's going? Super Team Family. Why do I have wow. a complete run of Super Team Family in 9698? Uh, I purge my weird war tales in the last live sale. I purged my secret uh, society of super villain run in the last live sale, stuff like that. I, you know, I bought it cause it was high grade and it was funky oddball bronze age. I don't want it now. So I'm making room for warlord enough said, uh, I want to remind everybody cause we got asked this in uh, viewer mail, um, uh, last week. Where can I get a Bronze and Modern Gods t-shirt? Well, now is the time. T Public, who is our t-shirt partner, is having a Memorial Day sale. And by that, I mean they have 35% off Bronze and Modern Gods t-shirts, just $16.99 through Monday night. It ends Memorial Day night. Look in the description and you'll find a link to buy a t-shirt. Evan, what is your next piece of viewer mail? Well, that means I now have to buy a t-shirt. Get on so that. I will be getting on that this weekend. All right. Uh, my my viewer mail comes from uh, Papa Ken Comics and War. Hey, guys, I really enjoy your show. Thank you for staying consistent and showing cool books that folks may not have seen. My question is, how many times has your particular interest and what you collected changed, say, from one era to another and one artist to another? So I will say I was a Marvel kid forever. Mm. X-Men 133 was my first book. I collected all the X-Men books. When I got to go to uh, um, my first LCS, which was uh, Dave Bala in his garage in Fairview Park, I uh, I bought Marvel stuff, just Marvel, like Marvel everything. And somewhere in the 80s, that changed pretty dramatically. And I started to really appreciate DC Comics. And the way that I've tried to explain it to people for years is Marvel always felt like real people with real problems. Peter Parker has got to pay the rent. He's got his sick aunt. Wolverine's got memory problems. Like everybody seems to have real everyday problems. And DC's characters are like myths. They are larger than life. Batman is the epitome of fear and Superman could do a handstand and push the earth into the sun. And Wonder Woman's can almost as strong as Superman. And she's got a magic lasso that makes you tell the truth. So like everything is like way out there. Right. And so, but I really started to dive pretty deep into the DC, um, all of the DC books that I never collected. So I got into Legion of Superheroes and it's interesting. Most of the Trinity I stayed away from for a long time, except for Batman. I just couldn't get into Superman and Wonder Woman. I had a hard time relating to them, but over time DC really kind of took over. And again, we talked about it like in the nineties, I lost passion in all of it because the writing was just so incredibly bad. So yeah, things did, come and go. Did you like weekly Superman? That period in the 90s when every week there was a different Superman title? No, like I said, I was pretty much out of the game for a lot of the 90s. I love that, um, but it yeah. was expensive. Uh, Papa Ken, hi, thanks for writing in. Um, I think you could get whiplash if you listen to this podcast by all the changes <laughs> I have in my focus. So it, that's what keeps it fun for me. I change. Um, I will be, here's a brutally, brutally honest answer. 
my focus changes as my income changes. Right. Good point. Uh, the more money I have as a, you know, 50 something year old guy, all of a sudden I'm buying Venus books. All of a sudden I'm buying mm -hmm. Atlas war titles, books, young men, you know, number 24 books I dreamed of having as a kid when I would see them in the overstreet that now are within my reach. Uh, that changes my focus. Uh, why am I buying uh, Ultimate Fallout 4 when I can buy Captain America number 74? Right. Uh, you know, things like that. So I think that's a big component of it is what money do you have? Uh, my next piece of your mail comes from our email at bronzeandmoderngods at gmail.com. And I please, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Forgive me. Rim Edervine. Hi there, gentlemen. Greetings from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Holy crap. I'm a longtime fan of your channel and I make it a point not to miss any of your weekly episodes. Love the gentle bickering and ribbing amongst the two of you. <laughs> cool. uh, it gives the whole thing a nice and relaxed atmosphere as it should be since collecting should be fun. Dealers, flippers, and investors can be serious. Collectors do it for the joy. Amen, Rim. Yep. I especially love your show and tell segment because it regularly features items not to be seen in Europe. Um, atomic agent as such ever hardly turned up over here. So anytime you show them, it's a treat. Doll man bondage covers are <laughs> rock. So nothing but praise as far as the comic content goes. But there's always a but, isn't there? John, as a fellow former music industry veteran, I have to let you know, to my great disappointment, goofed when telling Richard that Shocking Blue, the original performers of the classic pop song Venus, were Danish. They are not. Uh -oh. They are a Dutch band hailing from my town of birth, The Hague. Don Haag in Dutch. If I said mm -hmm. that right, please forgive me, Rem. They wrote history in the Netherlands by being the first Dutch band ever to reach the number one spot in the Billboard charts, an accomplishment very seldom repeated, possibly the best known. Other songs to do the same is Radar Love by Golden Earring. Uh -huh. Once again, really love your show. Can't fall on the comic content. Just had to let you know about the music goof. Yes. Just to be sure, John, please don't take my disappointment as tongue in cheek as it could be. I share your love for acts like Bowie, the musical love of my life. Amen. And was pleasantly surprised to hear you mention ABC a couple of weeks ago. I was really starting to fear that I was the only one fondly remembering them. Kind no, no. We all love ABC here. Yes, Rip, we do. I didn't say Danish. I said Swedish. So there's that. Oh. <laughs> which is even worse um i you're absolutely right shocking blue are uh, a dutch band uh you i'm surprised Rim, you didn't mention my favorite dutch band of all time because i just love saying it hocus pocus by the band focus <laughs> uh golden earring weren't were betty severt from the indie rock uh from the 90s i believe they were dutch as well mm. uh urban dance squad i think were from the netherlands uh oh netherland rock don't get me started thank you for writing in bowie forever uh and no you did not offend me whatsoever i love the correction evan your last well, if, if it makes you feel any better john i'm gonna throw myself right under the bus right now about three years ago it occurred to me that lita ford was Lita from the Runaways? It, you know, Joan Jett was in the Runaways too. I hope. Yes, that one I knew, but like I never put those two together, and I have gotten a beating for it, and I deserve it. So if it makes you feel any better. Oh my God. <laughs> Lord. Okay, moving on. Uh, your last <sighs> viewer mail. Yes, uh, the next viewer mail, the last viewer mail is from uh, Peyton Ardoin, mm -hmm. and I love this question. Why do the Flash and Superman always race? Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I love that. It's great. I Look, the reason they race is because that, that conversation sounds like two comic book nerds having a conversation. Like, what do you think? Who, who do you think would win, Superman or Flash? And someone in the DC studios or, or in, the, in the DC realm was like, we should totally do something like that. That is the best kind of Marvel stuff. I put the Superman Flash races right up there with the X-Men baseball games. It's dumb, fun, goofy. Who would win? The Hulk or the Thing? Exactly. That kind of stuff. You know what, though? But it's fun. And, and 
then they even decided to throw it into the movie just for extra giggles, even though it wasn't the Zack Snyder version. But um, I love stuff like that. I Those X-Men baseball games are iconic. Every once in a while they try to do one, but it's not the same. So I, I love when they pit two heroes against each other without serious, heavy overtones and ramifications. And how about they just have a good time? Peyton, why do Superman and Flash race? Because they can. Moving on to 1984, <laughs> it's time for the old fart rule. Yay. You need to do the gesture. You didn't do. Oh, the... I don't know the gesture. Were, were we leaning back in the oh. chair? You're out. You're out. Old fart rule. <laughs> Come back here. Uh, this week, we go back to 1984, uh, the books that shaped our collecting lives. This is a, a, an unusual one because Charlton Comics. We're on our, the last gasp of Charlton. Mm -hmm. Ghostly Tales, number 169. This is the final issue of this long-running Bronze Age horror title from good old Charlton Comics that began in 1966, ran all the way to 84, 18 years. This issue features a cover by a young Mike Zek, wow. originally published in 1976 when he was just starting out. It's a reprint of a 76 cover. Look at that cover. Um, I know DC Bronze is getting all the love now with their Bernie Wrightsons and their Michael Kaludas, but I think the Charlton Tom Sutton covers and the Mike Zek and Don Newton, these are really underrated a high grade raw copy of this sold in february for 20 bucks on ebay which for a charlton oh. book 20 bucks these charlton horror books are kind of like the wild west right now for collectors there's low demand excellent covers they're tough to find in high grade uh going back to our first question of reviewer mail uh brian thorne maybe start collecting charlton bronze age horror maybe that you know gives you a, a new fire <laughs> Uh, three things full circle. This issue also features a one page filler by Don Perlin, who passed away this week, mm. uh, which is also from 1976 when he was first starting out. He was a Charlton guy. So, uh, lots of underrated artists in these Charlton books. Did you ever, ever pick up Charlton's when you were a kid? I, I did. I, so it's funny. I never really did a lot of the horror books. I mean, when you, when you threw this one in uh, for the old fart rule, when I looked at it, I'm like, how old fart are we talking? This looks old. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, so if you just flashed this cover at me, I never would have guessed this was from 1984. I would have said 70s. And it was. That, that makes a lot of sense, right? But I love the the cover and the and the art style. I just never I was always the superhero guy. Yeah. I don't know why. Just never got into the horror stuff. Would you have ever guessed that's Mike Zek looking at this cover? No. Yeah. I it, I kind of see it in the the demon's face. I can kind of see that Zek style in there, but like the smoke and everything else. No, definitely not Mike Zek. Yeah. No. Uh, let's move on to our underrated books of the week. <gasps> Evan, go for it. I love this book. Do I have a gesture or no? Nope. This is I it. I just do this one. <laughs> Lean right into it. All right. So remember we were just discussing, you know, somewhere along my other oh, way I pivoted into a DC, um, passion and love for for their their half of the books when i was such a marvel kid and this book was a big part of why this is fury of fire fury of firestorm volume two number one so this is 1982 jerry conway is writing it you know i let len wine is the editor this is the first appearance of black bison or whatever but but it introduced a whole bunch of characters and really i started to fall in love with the DC side of things, because the firestorm entity is, is much, much bigger than life, but, and I will play devil's advocate for myself here. There is a little of that Marvel, uh, personal people who have, um, personal problems. So Ronnie's a college kid and the professor is a, this super smart guy. And when they merge together, you got Ronnie who isn't the smartest kid in the world and the professor who's doing the brain driving for firestorm but what a cool concept and and uh he can alter matter unless it's organic and then it gives him feedback and it hurts and i'm like oh my god this character is amazing and they have tried to do things with firestorm so many times over the years but i think you run into the same problem you do with superman sometimes where how do you beat somebody who can alter matter 
Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's really tough to, you, you you have to job the guy to get book, you know, some of the stories to work. You're, you're still in it. You tell me, is he still a fire elemental? No. Okay. Cause no. that was the John Ostrander reboot, which yes. where I came on board and I kind yep. of liked it. Uh, I don't think it, you know, it's, it's Swamp Thing Jr. It is nearly not a lot you can do when you're a god, basically. Yeah. But Fury of Firestorm. It, you say it got you into DC. There was a simple reason. It was their most Marvel title. They were yeah. out of their way, especially uh, this reboot. But back in the 70s, when it was first launched, it was Jerry Conway and Al Milgram doing Spider-Man, except as a jock, you know. Yep. Uh, and it, it, I was the only DC book I read besides shade. I think those were the only two I was reading. I think I picked up steel and I was like, Oh, Don heck moving oh, on. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. The book, the book is going for 60 bucks. Yeah. Um, the newsstand is going for a hundred, which I have for 9.8, 9.8, yep, which I think this probably is. Um, nice. I, this is one of the books that I, I kind of took care of. Cause again, you know, this is a book that got me to love DC. So, um, but I did not realize the newsstand was going for higher. So I will probably yeah. press that one. I was buying the flash for the firestorm backups by George Perez. I mean, great I character. Didn't and they, care. They, they, they did him in the DC in the um, CW verse. Did they? Yeah, it was okay, I guess. Um, and then he was in legends of tomorrow for a minute, but, uh, and they even, they even did death storm, which is the evil version of, a firestorm uh but yeah that book is it does my heart good it reminds me of why i fell in love with dc i bought it when it came out i love pat broderick uh followed him over he left micronauts for that book i believe mm -hmm. uh so i was like oh he's leaving i like him on micronauts but he's drawing this now uh so yeah good good choice all right i'm gonna shock everybody evan was teasing that he was gonna bring the modern into bronze and modern <laughs> let me let me one up you my underrated book this week came out on Wednesday. Oh, this past Wednesday. It is Union Jack the Ripper, number one. What? What's up with this? Uh, all right. I have a soft spot for Union Jack ever since I was a kid and he was in the Invaders. And I, the costume is a great costume. I mean, you can't design a better costume than it's that. It's excellent. Yep. It's the best. Uh, poor Captain Britain's probably like, hey, Darn it, that should have been my costume. <laughs> um, great character. I'm kind of out of touch with what Union Jack is now. I was kind of hoping this was a 1940s book. It's not. It takes place as part of the whole Blood Hunt crossover. I read it. Here are the negatives first. Let me get the negatives out of the way just because I have to. <laughs> of course. You read Blood Hunt. Yep. Is it just in this book that all the vampires are being drawn with all their teeth as fangs and not just their incisors? No. Okay, no. whoever the artist is, let, uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, Walker, I don't know who that is. He's yeah. drawing the vampires with all sharp teeth. No, that's not what vampires are. Yeah. Um, please stop that. Just incisors, yep. Okay, good. You have a mature reader's title with all the blood and gore, for parental, parental advisory. It's really gory. But you're curse, the censoring the curse words by blacking them out? You're already, why? Who cares? Marvel's been doing that a lot. Four ninety nine price tag. I just have to mention that. Now the positives: fantastic, beautiful cover by a guy named Ryan Brown. Agreed. Kind of like a Glenn Fabry type. Uh, is it Fabry or Farby? One of the two. Uh, I love that painted sure. feel. Um, I like that it references and ties in with the Union miniseries that came out a couple years ago that was focused on all the UK heroes mm -hmm. uh, plus for continuity issue one interesting enough to keep me coming back which I haven't said that about a Marvel book since Captain America relaunched and now I'm like oh. um, if you haven't gotten this yet there's a second print coming in July so if you see this grab it I can't imagine this got lots of orders from retailers as well pleasantly surprised I was kind of holding my nose buying this thinking i love union jack i love the cover I, it better be good it was a solid as they say a bloop single in baseball so i am pleasantly surprised and i'm gonna tear up a little bit you picked a modern book brand new i'm so excited i will however say that blood hunt is terrible yeah. so 
massive spoiler. If you don't want to hear this, skip ahead a couple seconds. Do you know who the big bad in Blood Hunt is? It's it's Blade, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I hate this yeah. is Scarlet Witch all over again for me. He was just in the Avengers like last year. So they have spent time, effort, and money building this guy up for his solo movie that keeps having production problems. They put him in the Avengers and then they let's, chuck it all and give him a superhero, a supervillain team of vampires. Let's be fair. There might be a reveal coming. This, oh, stop. The story's not over yet. You know, Is it all a dream? Is that the reveal? I don't know, but it, it might be some some intentional misdirection. Now, let's not judge it till it's over. And the hero, by the way, is Dracula. Uh, let's not judge it till it's over. It might be. A, yeah. Uh, but I will say Union Jack, surprisingly good. Um, ish. By the way, I thought you were going to be super proud of me because I made a baseball reference. I'm doubly proud of you. A modern book and baseball <laughs> references. This is a fantastic episode. Sports ball. <laughs> Nicely done, John. Thank you. And nicely done, Evan, for co-hosting and Thank stepping you. in. Richard will be back on Wednesday for our members-only uh, episode. And Thursday will be members-only live stream. If you want to join us and for show and tell, DM me at Bronze of Modern Gods uh, on Instagram. And everybody give a round of applause to Evan for joining us. Thank you, Evan. It was my pleasure. You know, I'm always ready to go. Talk you about can... comic books. Psst. Right? If you can edit these episodes, you could be on every week. <laughs> uh... We'll see you next time. Stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>